Jim, are you online? Okay. Uh, well, all the all the person Perella. All the person Salazar. She's not online. Okay. All the person Savaglio. Present. Okay. All the person born. There he is. Can you hear us, Jim? Jim. He froze. <laughs> He's frozen. <laughs> Looking very stoic. Okay. Is he on? Do we have a quorum? There's a quorum without him, so we have to move for but I'm sure Jim would like to be on it. <laughs> He's here. Is it good? Can you hear me now? Yep, we got you. Can you, you hear now. me yep. now? Yep, <laughs> we hear you, Jim. All right. All right, good. Okay, we'll start out with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> all righty. We'll start out with uh, 2.1, approval of minutes from April 13th. Second. Motion's been made by Grazia, seconded by Marcus. Any other discussion on those minutes? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye, the minutes are approved. Item for discussions 3.1, RO number 8-21-22, uh, document 3.2, submitting the request to dis disinter Mickey Carey, who was interred at Wildwood Cemetery, lot 215, section 18, grave two, and relocate his remains in the Wildwood Cemetery to lot 215, section 18, grave one, that is owned by his spouse, Mary Carey. Director Buell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so what this, this is before you this evening, and uh, these are pretty very rare cases. I would have to say, I think in my tenure, I've, this has only maybe happened a handful of times. Uh, however, what has happened is, is as, as the information is described, is that when the person was buried in the lot, it was located in the lot next to the vacant spot and it actually has to be shifted over so it matches with the stone and the inscription. So the reason it's before you is by ordinance, I, we're not allowed to make a correction without the committee's approval. So I just wanna let you know, typically in some, in fact, uh, I'll be honest and thanks to Thomas and his forthright and uh, do research here is he's the one who pointed this out to us. So when, what we're asking for is that uh, you, basically you allow this, this correction to be occurred. Um, and I'm going to defer to the Assistant City Attorney Thomas Cameron to uh, correct maybe the action because this really doesn't have to go to, to Common Council. This can just be handled at the committee. So I just uh, maybe allow uh, Thomas to explain the verbiage for the proper motion to make this correction. Okay, go ahead, Thomas. Thank you. Um, so this, this actually is an item which can be done at the committee level. Normally uh, items are referred back to council for final action, um, but the, the way the ordinance is set up, this one is done at the committee level. So if the desire is to allow for the, the disinterment and the reinterment, our recommended motion would be a motion to approve disinterment and to allow disinterment to occur prior to October 1, 2021. And the purpose for that second piece is as the, as the code is written, normally disinterment can only happen be between October 1 and December 15th, uh, unless there's special permission of the Public Works Committee. So by rolling that in uh, into that single motion, that allows the disinterment to, to happen as quickly as, as possible. Okay. okay. I would make that motion. Second. 
There's uh, been a motion by Market, second by Grazia. Um, I have a couple questions. Sure, go right ahead. So um, why do we need to approve this? Like, is there a reason in, in the statutes that this has to exist or should, wouldn't, it feels to me like this is something that if there was a mistake made, you guys should be able to just fix it without coming to us. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree, but by, by, by the ordinance, the way it's written today, that this is the proper procedure for this type of correction and disinterment to, to occur. It's, it's, it's a practice, typically, I mean, we do get requests for people to be disinterned and moved to other cemeteries, and it, it's a pretty disruptive process, so we don't take it lightly. Mm -hmm. So there was probably a process that's why it had to come to this committee and just inform you of it. Uh, but as well, I, I, I'll do, also defer to Thomas on this, and he maybe can further explain some of the background on it. Yeah, and, and when, when Director Beeble uh, was saying there have been you know, a handful of these, he's referring to the sort of the more traditional disinterment of someone who's buried here and you've decided to move them to a, an entirely different cemetery or there's, there's some you know, more, more distinct movement going on here. Uh, the, what happened here, you know, to even call it the exception that proves the rule is maybe going you know, too far. There, there isn't a process for you know, adjusting that, that staff level um, mistake. So we're, we're dealing with it just like we would any other disinterment. Thank you. I've, I've got a follow up to that. If, sure, if go ahead. Um, how was this mistake made, and what are we doing to make sure that we're not moving stuff around again? <laughs> Correct. Well, we we put in some pretty good procedures. We have actual forms to be signed off by the funeral home as well as staff. And uh, I can inform you that the person that took this order and expedited it is no longer with our staff at, uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Right. Any other discussion on this? I have just one more question. Grazie. Go ahead, Grazia. So the and the, the Mrs. Kelly has to has to approve, right? The spouse has to yeah, approve. They're actually they're, the spouse is actually requesting that this be corrected. Yes, correct. Thank you. Word. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion on this? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. That is approved. 3.2, General Ordinance 21-22, document 6.1, an ordinance removing the one-way street designation for South 14th Street between Georgia Avenue and Broadway Avenue. Ryan, is that yours? Yeah. Okay. Um, this ordinance relates directly to the, the Oscar development, which is uh, the development of 240 apartment units at the former Vandevart site. Mm -hmm. Back in 2019, when the developer came to the Department of Public Works proposing this project, the first thing we asked the developer to do, or we told the developer to do, is submit a traffic study, because obviously traffic flow is going to change once you build 240 apartment units, along with a development such as a quick trip. And as part of this traffic study, it, um, it became apparent that because of the, the, the added traffic movements from this development, that traffic signals were gonna be warranted at the intersection of 14th and Georgia. I'm sorry, at South Business Drive in Georgia, in Georgia Avenue, and they're scheduled to be installed this, this late summer, this fall sometime. But also as part of this study, if, if you're familiar with this section of 14th Street between Broadway <clears throat> and Georgia, it, it, it exits very close to the South Business Drive Georgia intersection is just it's just not safe. So as part of this study, um, we were told to look at eliminating the one-way street, putting a cul-de-sac at the um, north end of uh, 14th Street by Georgia, and making it into a two-way street. So this directs this. This goes back all, all all back to 2019. And the reason we didn't switch it back in 2019, we wanted to make sure this project was going was going forward, which it is now, obviously. So that's why we're here, just to make it a two-way street. We sent letters out. Oh, uh, last winter, we never we never had a formal meeting, but I sent letters out, got tons of phone calls, people are aware of it. Uh, we plan on probably making this change, I'm guessing, next week. So later on this week, we'll put up a message board and I'll, I'll, do, I'll do another letter drop so people, people are aware of it. The street's wide enough to support two-way traffic along, two-way street along, along, along with the parking on both sides, so there won't be any hardship of, el of elimination of parking. So uh, has, the, has it been pretty positive? Um Feedback from the from the residents in that yeah, area. Yeah, okay. yeah, it has. Good. Yeah, Good. it has. And we, we did a similar thing back in the early 2000s for Colorado Court up in this area. Yes, that was also a one-way street. We called the sack that off. So yeah, it is. I think it's, it's just going to stop all that all that 
through traffic that I should say unnecessary through traffic because unless you live on that street, you're not going to drive on it because you can't, you really can't get out. So yeah. it, it has, it has been positive. Okay, good, good, good. Any other comments on it? I make a motion to approve this. Um, second for it. Motion made by, by Marcus, seconded by Jim. Uh, any other discussion? On? I've got one question. Go ahead. What's the extra long part that doesn't seem like it's part of a normal cul-de-sac? that extends to the north. Uh, I'm looking at map. Oh, that's at the very end of Georgia Avenue. There's a business there. Okay. Um, I think it's going to have a storage business for a landscaping business. So we just got to give them access. They have a super long driveway there. So that'll be a driveway. That'll be a driveway. Yeah, it'll be actually kind of an extension of their, of their, of their driveway is what, it, what it's, what it's going to be. Thank you. That's why it's like that. Okay. Any other discussion on this? Yes, just for, for my education, when there is a, a study done, what does that mean? Pardon me? When there is a study done, so there, there has been a study, mm -hmm. right? So what does that entail? Okay, what they, what they look at is say, okay, this, this development, this 240 um, apartment complex and um, quick trip, it's all, it's all fully built. And they, they, have, they have models, they, they, they have enough records to determine, okay, there's gonna be, X amount of cars during this time. It's a it's it's a study. I guess it's a, a good a good guess on what on what what they think the traffic flow is going to be through the course of a day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with, with a lot of like the developments, they'll have certain generators of traffic. Right. They're they're going to say quick trips going to generate you know three thousand vehicles per day between this time and this time, and then the apartment complex will have a peak volume of exit mm -hmm. based on the number of residents, and it's going to and it's going to flow to some's going to go to Georgia and some's going to go to Broadway, and they'll model it as as city engineer Ryan mm -hmm. has said, mm -hmm. and based on that model, they'll say okay, with the traffic, <laughs> there's going to be delay now at Georgia Avenue. And, with, and it's gonna be dangerous without traffic signals for that delay for those vehicles to cross. Therefore, traffic signals are necessary. And by when we put in the traffic signals to make the traffic signals work, the cul-de-sac needs to be put in so that certain turning movements, again, aren't being compromised and safety of traffic flow. So it, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of data that goes into these models. Uh, very time consuming in the model and the report can be, you know, the summary is pretty, pretty simple, but the data and the model and all the traffic data is very, very complex. And uh, we typically use traffic engineers. I think we used, uh, it was a TADI on mm -hmm. this one, uh, yeah. traffic analysis and design. They do, their, there's, a, there's limited, what I would say, traffic engineering firms right. in the state. There's probably maybe three or four that we typically will use. And, um, <laughs> And they use data that's from from decades and decades. It's not just data that they got last week. They put, yeah, they, yeah. It's, there's a lot of data, like like David mentioned, and uh, it's meant it's meant to to really optimize the traffic flow. You don't want to create traffic jams and delays and this kind of stuff. And you do it, and you do it for safety. Ryan, thank um, you very much. Ryan, just to add to that, this uh, the Oscar is obviously the the largest development that the city and almost county is going to see in estimates of 47 to 52 million dollars but aren't there going to be like 243 units in that development yep. yeah 200 and 240 units right so if you look at 240 there. units you're probably going to have over 300 vehicles as an example right and people coming and going not including the quick trip and the possible expansion in a future at a future time for a storage unit so there right. obviously they do have the models but there there is this is a very large um, area with a lot of additional roads and housing around it that they had to take into consideration. And I would just add that I, I think that that in the even in the past before this before this development was here that this was kind of a, a, a very a very uh, tricky intersection to cross in the first place on George Avenue. Um, so. I can't remember when David might remember, but there used to be traffic signals at. at Silk Business Drive in Georgia years ago, and they were taken down for, for yeah, various it, it reasons. Was, it was back in the 80s and when Broadway Avenue Viaduct the, was reconstructed, okay. I think it was about in 88, 89-ish, uh -huh. uh, the decision was to take the signals out at that time because mm -hmm. uh, traffic flow was decreasing at that intersection. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, partly because, if you recall, there used to be a restaurant, Terry's Diner. Yeah. There was a pretty good traffic, and there was a lot of people that used to frequent that. That was removed as part of that expansion project. I believe they bought their, bought it, and then some of the restaurant, and that land was uh, acquired as part of the reconstruction project. So that's when the traffic signals came out. But they, they you know, it was at the time, well, what are we going to do? Uh, but traffic it was settled down, but now we can foresee traffic will be uh, much, much greater again. And with the curve in South Business Drive as well as the sight lines, it makes it very difficult to cross. Yeah, I would say so. Any other discussion on this? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. That is approved. Okay, 3.3, .3, General Ordinance 2-2122, document 6.2, an ordinance creating parking limits so as to add a two hour parking limit, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. except Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays to the north side of Erie Avenue between North 8th Street and North 9th Street. Right, yeah, this is, yeah, what, what the intersection we're talking about is uh, like North 8th Street and Erie Avenue. We're talking, it's the uh, northwest corner, it's where Topper's Pizza is. There used to be a, a bus stop there, and several years ago that bus stop was was, was eliminated. So with Topper's Pizza and several other businesses around, I was wondering if we could get, when you, when you have a bus stop anywhere, you always mark it no parking because you don't want someone parking there, so when the bus shows up. Yeah. Um, so these businesses just asked to have that no parking taken down and just, just extend the two-hour parking for their businesses, especially, especially our restaurants such as Topper's. I'm sure there's a lot of turnover there, mm -hmm. and they're always looking for a close spot, so it made sense. I, didn't, I, I, I wasn't aware that the uh, bus stop got eliminated, but that's fine, so we're just changing the, the, uh, the two-hour parking. So I, you mind if I speak? Go ahead. So I like that idea, giving more freedom of people to park in our city. Uh, aren't there um, metered parking spots in that area already? Shouldn't we be putting the meters in? Not, not in this section of Erie Avenue. You're probably thinking of A Street. I said it's a corner of Erie and uh, North A Street. This, this bus stop was on Erie Avenue. There is no, there is no meters there. Not along, so this is where, like, um, like by that barber shop in between barber shop and Toppers. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's on Erie Avenue on the north side of the road. It's not, it's not on Eighth. Eighth is, is metered very heavily, but not, not, uh, not Erie. Right. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion on this? Do Make a motion to approve. Uh, I've got a question, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Jim. Thank you. Uh, does this, is this going to present any problems with the farmer's market during the summer? Uh, because I know there is some metered parking around there. And uh, if this is not going to, two hour parking is not going to be a, in effect on Saturday, uh, Saturday when the farmer's market is there, is that going to create any problems with people kind of camping out there for the whole morning or the vendors parking there and then uh, uh, not giving access to those businesses? Um, I, I guess I'm looking at it, it's, it's going to add more parking for, for the farmer's market. It's going to add to it. Um, someone staying there longer term than two hours, they can on the weekends. I guess if it is an issue, we'll, we'll deal with it then. But no, I think it's going to be a positive for the farmer's market just because it's just going to add more parking. Gr granted, it's only like maybe four or five spots, but um, it gets pretty crowded, so everything helps. Well, my, con my, con uh, my concern is I, I, I hope you do monitor it the first few weeks there because uh, if there's no meters there and there's no limit on how long you can park there, I just hope people don't take advantage of that, either the vendors parking there or or people, uh, you know, abusing it and just staying there for the, you know, the entire morning. Thank you. And I, and I have a feeling some of the businesses around there, if it does become an issue, they'll be calling our office. And like I said, then we can deal with it at that time. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'll make, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Okay, motion made by, sec by Jim, second by Marcus. Marcus, you have a comment? Yes, I do. Um, uh, do. Does anyone from Public Works happen to know what the, um, on that sign, There's. it looks like there's a two hour parking sticker on there. Do you know what it actually reads for oh, the people going to the west or for parking to the west? Oh, it's two hour parking. I think it's Monday through Friday, um, not Saturdays and Sundays. So we're just looking to extend what's yeah, already there exactly, to basically yeah. the corner or as yep. far as you can go. Extending okay, it, thank correct. you. Any other discussion on that? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. That is approved. Okay, 
3.4, resolution 5-2122, document 7.3, a resolution authorizing the appropriate city officials to enter into a contract with Parms Tree Service Incorporated for the removal of 676 tree stumps. Uh, Joe? Mr. Mr. Chairman, oh. uh, Superintendent of Parks and Forestry, Joe Curlin will talk on this as well as uh, Tim Bull, our city forester is here. Okay. Um, I guess if Scott, could you could put up this, the, the, the screen, at least for the laptop, share my screen. This just is a map of the stumps of the contract as well as all the stumps in the city that need to be removed. And there's further, for further clarification of what this contract will be performing and maybe Tim and Joe could further expand upon this. Okay, go ahead. Right. I'll just run through the IFC and then I'm gonna get Tim up here to answer uh, the questions. Uh, he's the man be behind the scene with all the forestry. So um, we're just asking for um, approval to, to, to go into a contract with Palm Tree Service uh, for the removal of 676 stumps. We have two capital um, accounts that we're, we're using to do this. So it, um, our forestry uh, management is, is set up in capital improvements. Um, so at this time, uh, Tim's gonna cover this too, but we have over 1,060 some stumps out there. Uh, stumps is just one of our uh, things that we do for forestry management. Uh, removals, before the ash borer even started, we were averaging right around 500 tree removals. And then with the management plan, we really had to bump that up to start getting rid of the ash. And, and uh, as some of you will remember, uh, that our goal was with 5,000 ash trees out there uh, to treat half of them and remove half of them. And we are at that point now. I'm gonna let Tim talk more about that. But that, that is a great first, huge first step since 2016. Um, and we've always been able to do, handle forestry management for the most part within house, but within the last couple of years, we really had to start stepping outside, um, picking some contracting that we needed, either tree removals or stump removals, and, th and this is just one of them, to get us caught up to where we need to be, where we can um, hopefully get back to that point where we can handle it ourselves. So uh, we've made great strides, Tim. Um, Tim and the tree crew, it's just, uh, it's been great uh, with our GIS. They've been able to, uh, you know, ask them a question and they can tell you right now. Uh, Todd's seen it firsthand at a meeting where I, Tim just pulled it up right there. There was a question asked and could tell you everything about the tree the lady was asking about. So um, the management of our, our forestry, urban forestry has been going real smooth the last few years. So we did have um, four bids. Uh, Wallace Tree Care, Parms Landscaping, Bruce the Stump Guy, Plymouth Landscape, and and Tim's going to point out he put up four quadrants, quadrants, and we bid those out separately, and Parms Landscape was the low bid on all four quadrants. So we're asking for the approval of uh, uh, eighty-four thousand nine hundred fifty dollars with Parm Landscape. Tim, you want to come up? Thanks, Joe. Yeah, the um, the map you can see the one on the right shows all of our stumps. The one on the left is the four quadrants that Parms is going to do for us, and uh, hopefully with your approval. And they gave us a good price. It's uh, very fair, in my opinion. And uh, w with those stumps done, those 676, that leaves us with about 400 currently. And our plan is to grind about 100 a month starting in May. And so by May, June, July, we'll have some more added by then, but by the end of summer, we should be, if Farms finishes up, we should be totally caught up on our stumps. And and the reason we're, we're so far behind was in 19, we, we stopped grinding stumps for the most part to get caught up on the ash removals that were standing dead. So now we're at a point where we, we wanna get caught up with the stumps and stay caught up with the removals and by, by allowing farms to do this for us, that, that's, gonna, that's gonna get us there. Any, any other questions? I just have a quick comment on it. I, I'm, I'm glad to see that this this come, come forward. I, real, um, I know that you guys have done a great job as far as removing the trees and, and removing the trees is top priority because a stump's not gonna fall and fall on a car. So I mean, to, to get the trees down was the, was the main thing. And I, I think that the way you guys have handled this, you know, I, I commend you on it. Uh, I think this is the way to go, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm 
Be happy to see this. Go ahead, Marcus. I'd make a motion to approve. Second, Second. foreign. <laughs> Motions by made by Mark, seconded by Jim. Any other discussion? I, was I, just have, a, I have a question. I have a question, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Process. I was just wondering. So, is it possible to replant in the same spot where the plant, the stump, is removed? You, to replant, yeah. Many times we're we're planting trees in the same exact spot. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Jim, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to ask if I could lobby to have that quadrant done that was done in pink there. That that would be closest to my district 10. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer the green first. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's flip a coin. <laughs> <laughs> let's leave this one alone. Yeah. <laughs> Any other discussion without lobbying? <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. That is approved. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay. Uh, 3.5, resolution 6 2122, document 7.4, resolution authorizing the appropriate city officials to enter into a contract with Enterprise FM Trust and Enterprise Fleet, Fleet Management Incorporated for the lease of vehicles, the disposal of vehicles, and the maintenance of vehicles, and the authorizing the city administrator to administer the lease program to the extent funds are appropriated. Is this yours, Todd, or is this? No, actually, Jared? David will David, start. David well, starts out? Wait, okay. I, I, can, I can start out, Mr. Chairman, and then okay. I'll defer to City Administrator Wolf here in, in a bit. This is, as, as you probably are familiar with this, uh, was presented in detail in terms of the program leasing of our vehicles for DPW, especially our, what we call as our light duty or small, mainly pickup trucks, vehicles up to one ton. So yeah. that's roughly between 50 and 60 vehicles of the fleet, large portion of our fleet. And quite frankly, not a, not a portion of the fleet that got a lot of love or a lot of priority in the past. Uh, because of other priorities with the heavy equipment that we need and the heavy equipment uh, is the much larger, more costly. So uh, with City Administrator Wolf and, and the staff, we, we reviewed some of the proposals and he, he brought this to our attention with the, the finance department in terms of the opportunity to lease. And quite frankly, we're very excited about the program uh, because it will upgrade a significant portion of our fleet that is, again, as I mentioned, not, not an area that we uh, typically upgrade due to priorities, as well as this will provide better fuel efficiency as well as significant cost savings. And uh, we're excited about the project. Uh, it was also this portion of this lease program also affects the capital moving forward. So when we talk about the capital tonight, the capital's built in that this lease is gonna be going. So just wanted to let you <laughs> let you get that thought in your mind. So with that, if City Administrator Wolf would like to add add to the discussion, that'd be great. Thank you, Director Beevil. Yeah, I'm very excited about this. Uh, we've been talking about this for quite a while. Uh, this is an integral part to the continued uh, growth and success of the city. Uh, if we all remember as part of the state of the city, our number two uh, area of concern was our fleet, our city fleet, and this takes care of that so that it also allows us to free up um, some of our general obligation borrowing that continue to happen year over year because for those of you that remember, uh, on a regular basis we were replacing some of these pieces uh, on, with general obligation debt, which means that we had 10-year loans that we were basically financing vehicles for. So I did wanna point out the number one issue that's gonna supersede all of this is that the vehicles are going to be safer. So we talk about cost, we talk about uh, repairs, repair costs, things like that, but all of these vehicles will be new. So it's also gonna look better for our, our constituents because we're not gonna be driving around in 15 and 20 year old pieces of uh, city utility vehicles. We're actually gonna have new, uh, new equipment on a regular basis. And this should be a self-supporting self, self -supporting process 
and program. And it's, uh, it's going to be uh, very exciting for us to do this. And it's already been taken into consideration with our, our capital improvements program that you guys are gonna look at in just a few minutes. So thank you. Um, director, um, I'm sorry, um, Administrator Wolf, could you just um, kind of go over it? You guys, have, you guys did go through this with some, some other cities, as I recall, for the last. And just yes. Gotta go over yes. that. No, I compare how how they, they're uh, actually all of the other municipalities that are doing this, and it's also done in the private sector. Also, um, what happens is vehicles are replaced on a two to five year uh, program, depending on market, depending on usage, depending on demand. And what what will happen is the enterprise group will actually work with our. Our, um, I believe it's Rick, Rick Nye, will, um, he'll work with them directly. And it's really a hands-off operation for us. We've outlined the vehicles and it's one ton or less. And we're gonna start with public works first. And then we're going to look at expanding that into other departments um, at a later date. So the goal is to have newer vehicles on a regular basis, they'll be outfitted and the only thing that we, we will really have to do is oil changes and tire rotations. And we'll also be able to outsource that if needed at a reduced rate. There, 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 the, the, the real beauty of the program is, is, is the quick turnaround because we, we're able to use our, our government purchasing power along with the enterprise group when we acquire vehicles, we acquire them at much less value than what the general public is because of a governmental agency and our pricing through state contracts. But by quickly turning the vehicles over and reselling them, we actually should make money towards the value of our program and build value and equity to help fund this on an ongoing basis versus going out into the market and borrowing funds to acquire vehicles. And the, you could always say, well, why aren't you doing that today? Well, we just, it, it, the, the logistics behind it and the management of that type of, of program, working with a vendor that is in that program and in that resale market, in the rental business and leasing business, uh, it, it takes a tremendous amount of burden off of our shoulders as well as upgrades our fleet. So um, again, um, excited about the program and um, all the work again with our uh, assistant city attorney, Thomas, working through all the agreements and making sure that the city is protected through this. Um, it's, we're, we're excited to get going as, and time, timing is of the essence because we're placing orders right now because the 2022 models are coming online and that's what we're looking to get in and get our, our order in early so that by late fall, early winter, we'll have our, our fleet coming in. Any questions from anyone here? I've got a, a few questions. Go um, ahead. So I have been poking at the maintenance agreement and um, Administrator Wolf had mentioned that the oil changes are our responsibility, but it looks like uh, they're supposed to be covered in the maintenance agreement. Um, if, if I could get a little bit more understanding of that, and there's a lot of fine print here, so I'm gonna default to the lawyer in the room to tell me, <laughs> is this a good deal? And, and Thomas did a fantastic job um, arm wrestling with Enterprise, so if you can imagine, Enterprise is a very large company, but uh, Thomas did a great job putting them in check and holding them in the corner. Thanks. There, uh, there is a lot of fine print. Um, so there's, there's a maintenance agreement. Under that maintenance agreement, uh, oil changes would be included. There isn't the requirement that we enter into a maintenance agreement with every vehicle. So that, that's an option and based on cost, that may or may not make sense for any given vehicle. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of whether, you know, whether that will make sense is, is truly gonna be that that case by case basis. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, is it a good deal? I think it was Administrator Wolf who pointed out that everyone who seems to have done this has really positive things to say. Um, it's, it's weird to get 100% of the people you talk to to say nice things about almost anyone. Um, so I think that gives that gives a lot of comfort. Um, and the the cash flow projections 
I think sort of speak for themselves uh, directionally, not a not a legal answer so much as. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, and thank then I have Thomas. <laughs> one follow up for uh, the public works staff. Uh, so if we are truly not taking care of the vehicles we have now that are under a ton, um, how, what's the operational thing going to look like when we have to do we have to take the vehicles to a place to somebody come and pick up the cars for their oil changes and other stuff? How is that going to work? Well, we actually do take great care of our vehicles and it, it is a burden because we, we're, we have many of the average age of our fleet is 12 plus years old. We have some trucks 20 years old for pickup trucks. So we're, we're, we're doing the maintenance on them. This, this will actually alleviate some of it in terms of some of that ongoing preventative maintenance where we'll contract some of that out. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is a, a little logistical um, maneuvering, but we have picked a vendor that's relatively close to our, our shop. So we don't think there should be a lot of time and delay in terms of that transfer back and forth. And again, it's on a, we're gonna analyze the fleet and, and look at those vehicles that are used frequently that will be on that aggressive maintenance schedule and others that quite frankly, there are seasonal uh, aspects to some of our trucks and those might not get as much, let's say they're not gonna be maintained on a quarterly basis, it might be on a semi-annual basis. Mm. A good example is when you have older equipment, the older equipment tends to need not an oil change, but a lot more of other things that are timely and more, you know, take more time, take more cost. And this program is going to help alleviate some of that burden of the old equipment by, uh, because we'll never have it long enough to have to worry about it. And we're, we'll have warranties on, our, on all of our new vehicles. So if something does go sideways, it's somebody else's problem. Understood. I, I guess um, the, the, my question was too vague. Um, are we gonna send a dude to a dealership or is somebody gonna come and pick up the car? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, 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 what we'll do is we'll, we'll actually drive the vehicle to, to a vendor that will do the oil changes and maintenance for us. And then when it's done, either it will be dropped off or we'll have to send someone to pick it up. Thank you. I have one question. I have a question, have oh. a question Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, Grazia has one first and then you'll be second. Go ahead. Okay. Are we going to save money versus yeah. the, the previous? Yes. Thank you. Jim, go ahead. Uh, David, have you heard anything about uh, availability of vehicles? Uh, I went by a, a local uh, car dealership. Uh, I go by it quite often. I won't mention the name, but their inventory of new vehicles is probably 50% uh, or less than what it usually is. Is Enterprise having going to have any difficulty providing with the vehicles that we need because of the uh, you know, I guess, what is it? They can't get the circuit boards or something that they put into these new cars or the computer chips. Uh, is that filtering down into the truck world? Uh, very much so. And that is one of the concerns of the timeliness of this. So they can place their order for the next year's models and get early into that queue for deliveries. So, uh, but it, it's, it's industry wide uh, and it's not, it's, Yes, the pickup truck and that small that type of market is affected with the, I guess it's the chips that they're having difficulty acquiring to put into the vehicles. So if that would be the case and availability, then David, we would just we would just continue try to make try to make do with what we have and then as they come in, we're we're gradually getting into the new program. That's correct, yes. We're gonna to continue to operate as we have today and continue to maintain the fleet and, um, and just be patient. Uh, it, it's, and, and it happens quite frankly when we buy some of our larger dump trucks, our tri-axles, that there's sometimes anywhere from a nine month to a 12 month lead time on some of the equipment nowadays. And we just build that into our, our forecasting and, and, and plan accordingly. If you're ready for a motion, Mr. Chairman, I'd make a motion to approve. Second. Okay, motion is made by Jim, seconded by Marcus. Any other discussion on this? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. That is approved. 
3.6, capital improvement project, discussion only. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just gonna try to give a high level overview. Tonight's only discussion. The capital improvements has been already submitted and approved through the Capital Improvements Commission. But it's a good, a good opportunity for us to just give you a forecast. And many of these projects, for those that have been on the committee in the past, have heard these. Uh, Grazia, you being on Capital Improvements Commission has, has also helped that now you get to hear some of this again and give you another refresher. But I'm just really gonna focus on the 2022 projects, next year's projects. Even though it's a five-year plan, um, I'm not gonna take all night and quite frankly, all of your time to go through everything. And uh, if you have any questions or anything, please reach out to us and we can get you more detail. But I'm gonna start with the streets program. And uh, I think you, many of you must have seen this map that I've presented in the past. It's a city map of all of our past projects, which are the solid, solid lines on the map. And uh, the dashed lines are the future projects. Next year, the big project for street improvement is North Avenue. And that is from Calumet Drive all the way to Taylor Drive. Uh, it's a divided uh, boulevard section road, so it's double the, the amount of pavement that we would normally do on, on, on many of our streets. So that's a $1.2 million project in and of itself. The other one, we have some concrete work that we're continuing to do on panel replacements and, and replacing concrete uh, panels and squares, mainly on Calumet Drive, South Business Drive, those areas that are our main arterial that is concrete. It's in good condition, but there are panels that are cracked or starting to have delaminations in them and potholes that need to be patched. So we systematically go and we'll cut those out and replace it with new concrete. Next year, we, we have $500,000. That's gonna happen this year on, on a section. Again, next year in 2022, we're gonna just leapfrog and go down the road. So that will be a program that you'll see in the next couple of years as well as North 10th Street. This is by North High School. If anybody has gone by the cemetery or North High, there's very, very bad pavement panels that are um, just beyond resurfacing. We've, we've attempted to resurface it over the years. Uh, there's so much movement, poor soils, and uh, the, the asphalt peels away. So we're looking to do that next year as well. In addition to that, the, the other big project would be St. Clair Avenue. It's a neighborhood revitalization project between North 9th Street and North 14th Street. So those are the, the street projects uh, for 2022. I'm gonna go right into parks and forestry and really the big, the big item there is our urban forestry management. You just heard from our city forester and superintendent of parks and forestry tonight that's an ongoing battle with our, our community with the Emerald Ash Borer and our urban forest. But the good thing is, is that we're starting to transition from removals to planting. And our city forester uh, this year, we're putting in an actual uh, gravel bed for new trees to start being able to plant more trees, get them young, get them bare roots, take care of them, get it going and then we're able to plant and they have a much higher survival rate and, and growth potential. And uh, it, it's, it's an exciting proposition. We're working on that with the, it's, and we're utilizing actually, quite frankly, part of the old police impound that was behind our service building, which is now located. We were able to work with the police department, move their impound area out from the service building over to the police station. And now we have this area that we're able to put some trees in and help and really expedite the, the planting process. So that's an exciting venture. The other thing you'll see in 2022, a big improvement will be area Evergreen 5. And this is in coordination with the anticipated new bridge that we're gonna be putting in. We received some funding from the DNR NARDA program, Natural Resource Damage Assessment Fund. And with that, we're going to be doing some uh, pavement and enhancements and access to the bridge, as well as some shelter upgrades, and that's what that program is. In addition, you see 
We alternate between parks and buildings and grounds. Our ADA, Handicap Accessibility Program, that's an annual $250,000 allotment. The, the grand total of that whole program is roughly right around $2 million citywide. That would be any city building or anything where there's public access as well as park shelters and, and so forth. So uh, that's an ongoing pro, uh, program in our parks. I'm going to transition now to our city buildings for 2022. And we're doing a, a generator, the generator of the, at the building is, the, is original to the building. So it's over 50 plus years old. Yeah, we're not able to really get parts and the generator's inside the building. So with this, we're gonna remove that, move it to the outside of the building. But as part of that project, we need to upgrade also the electrical panel that that generator will feed. And the upgraded generator will require significantly upgraded uh, electronics along with it. So what you see is that is being part of that project, that 195,000. In addition, next year we're looking to do our vehicle wash. We have a, the, it's the original of vehicle wash bay and uh, the, the vehicle wash bay is quite narrow from the trucks, again, 50 years ago, weren't nearly the size of the trucks that we have today at the facility. So we're, what we're looking to do is there's a wall that we can remove and move over roughly around, I'd say eight to 12 feet to a, to a post and beam that it is really a, a perfect spot to just widen this. But when we widen it, we're also gonna build a stairwell and uh, what I would say a catwalk for employees to safely get on top of the vehicles and be able to spray down and, and instead of lifting up the box inside the building and uh, not do, being very effective at cleaning the inside of our vehicles, especially from the salting operations. So those are the two building, big building projects. The next thing I'm gonna go into is traffic control or street lighting. This is an ongoing annual program where we attempt to upgrade our existing city street lights from what I would say the orange metal hail, or the orange high pressure sodium, and then we have some white lights that are metal halide. This is going to the LED type of light, much brighter uh, and whiter light that is um, much more energy efficient. So we've been systematically upgrading our, our lighting fixtures throughout the city. There, you'll see there's some within a, what's called a TID district. That's a defined city area of blocks where there's been development and that, that development has created an, enough extra revenue for this infrastructure. The other, the other aspect of it is just citywide. It'd be outside of the district and it's just areas of the city that need upgrading. Again, that's, an, that's been an ongoing program for the last three years, and we're looking to go for probably another three into the future. Next, I'm gonna go to the motor vehicle fund, and really, it's really scaled back because of now, we're moving forward with the leasing program and pickup trucks. For 2022, we're only really purchasing two pieces of equipment. One's a street sweeper, for 195,000, or 295,000, excuse me. I wish it was 195. I can make that happen. <laughs> and uh, a skid steer, what, uh, uh, a, a brand name would be a Bobcat. So that's what we're looking to get, those two items. So, and then I'm moving to, I gotta find my sheet, wastewater, right? I think that's the last. And the big item in wastewater is really this project, and if I could have this go up on the screen. This is the salt, uh, salt side interceptor pipeline. Roughly runs from north of, of King Park all the way along the South Lake Shore to the wastewater treatment plant. It's roughly almost two, two miles in length, and it's a 60 inch sewer that handles basically half of the sewage flow to the plant approximately. And it also picks up some of, uh, sewage from the town of Sheboygan as well through this line. Uh, as you can see in the little photographs uh, down in, 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 in the lower right corner, 
the manhole structures and the, the revetment and the, the, the um, armament of, of stone and concrete that was in place was severely compromised, especially with the high water and wave action that we've been experiencing the last couple of years. We're fortunate this year, water's got receded somewhat. It's still at a high level though. It's still, it's not receded um, down to where it really would be what I would say normal uh, water level. Nevertheless, this project it will be looking to, especially along the red line, is going to be establishing a protective barrier of stone and revetment that will also provide an access road to maintain this line. If we actually had something catastrophic, it would have taken us uh, several days to get to this because of the severe uh, erosion that has occurred and um, limited access. So what this will provide is we'll provide a road for access as well as maintaining, as well as upgrading and strengthening this, this system. It's in good condition. It was built in the 1930s, 36, 1936. And it's in quite frankly, amazing condition. And we've, we took core samples of the concrete. It has very, very uh, good uh, section left in the pipe. So it's very structurally sound and it's performing at a high level today. So what we're gonna do is when we do this work, we're also gonna clean it, however. It has sand buildup and it, it has some, uh, with the buildup it loses some capacity, but by cleaning it and getting this access, uh, moving forward we'll be in a much better position uh, to respond to any emergencies as well as to maintain it when it would ever need to be rehabilitated. We'd have the ability to get in there and insert a liner and do a cured in place pipe at, at that point in the future. That's eight million dollars roughly. Uh, fortunately, we, we've applied for some grants uh, with some of the stimulus money potentially as well as the recovery money from the COVID relief bill. This activity is eligible. So ideally, this won't have to be borrowed funds or go on to the rate payers for the wastewater treatment or sewage bill, in other words. So we're working through that, but, but as a project, we still wanna make you aware of it. And when we get a little bit further detail down the road, we will come back to the council and let you know when we're going out for bids and where the funding sources will be ultimately from. Other than that, at the, the most of the other projects are at the, at the plant proper. Uh, there's some clarifiers that I talked about. There's some, just annual rehab at the plant of some of that. And every year, we have about a million dollars that we put in, and that just goes into actual infrastructure throughout the city. And quite frankly, a lot of it ties in with our streets. So wherever we're doing a street repair, we also will look at what's underneath the street and we will, will add and do the repair to the sewer lines as well. We don't wanna re repair a street and have the infrastructure underneath fail and have to, you know, uh, unfortunately we'd have to go through a new street and, and fix the infrastructure. That's not always a good thing. Uh, a good use of taxpayer dollars are, are public interest as well, so. Um, I know I, that was a high level quick overview, but um, again, we're here to answer questions and by all means take some of this and feel, feel free to reach out to, to my office or any of our staff and we'll provide more details of projects. And again, this is a plan. These projects always come back through this committee before we go out for construction or work on them so we can provide much more detail at that stage as well. Thank you, Director Beagle. Um, Administrator Wolf. Thank you, Dean. Um, I just wanna compliment the uh, Public Works team. Uh, this, this capital improvements pro, uh, program uh, was quite a bit different than what has been done in the past. And they came forward and they reviewed the projects. And we really, we look at the strategic planning uh, process versus um, what we've done in the past years. So I, I, wanna, I also wanna put a, a, a little bit of a plug in there that there's a, an EAM program that we've been talking about um, with council members and it's been brought up in other meetings. This is something that's going to help us with projects like this. It's going to help us to prioritize and plan 
for, for years in the future. So they did a great job. Um, we, when uh, Director Beeble was referencing some of the grants and, and upcoming funding, uh, there's the American Rescue Plan where they call out that the only, only infrastructure that money can be used for is wastewater, water, and broadband. So with wastewater and water projects, upwards of $50 million coming up in the next couple of years, we are definitely gonna be looking to put some money uh, towards these projects to reduce the, the uh, borrowing that the community is going to have to endure and the additional increase in um, water and sewer costs potential. So again, great job everybody and thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for the director? Or Mr. Chairman, I have a question for uh, the uh, administrator and then also possibly uh, David. Uh, Todd, yesterday it was announced, uh, came down the pike of all the various millions of dollars that communities are going to be receiving from the federal government uh, and Sheboygan's share of that is going to be $22 million. And I believe it has to be spent by the end of 2024. Uh, are these the dollars that you were just referencing before or are these any dollars that may filter down into the world of public works and the water utility and our waste wastewater treatment plant? Thank you, Alderborn. Uh, these are the American Rescue Plan dollars, uh, the city of Sheboygan, um, because of the position that we're in, we are actually getting 22.8 million. It'll be 11.4 in each trek. So we will be getting 11.4 this year and then 11.4 next year. Uh, that money is actually coming theoretically this May already. Um, so we are scrambling to make sure that we cross our T's and dot our I's. Um, there, the, as you had stated, uh, the, the Treasury Department did come out with a release on information yesterday, and we were having um, multiple meetings today with the League of Municipalities, and tomorrow we'll be having another overview of the guidelines. And again, as the government, um, state and federal, as we all know, clarity is not something that is very well defined. So we're still working through what we can and cannot do. But as I had stated before, the number one thing that was called out as far as infrastructure, the only thing that as far as infrastructure that the monies can be used for is wastewater, water and broadband. Broadband is a big, a big issue. Uh, the county is receiving 23 million and they'll be focusing on broadband in some respect. We're also going to be putting the monies towards um, social development as far as business relief and uh, constituent relief at the lower, um, lower economy levels. But we also have to remember that we don't want to have uh, start programs that the state is going to be ro um, rolling out also. So the state, uh, state of Wisconsin is planning on rolling out uh, millions of dollars into municipalities and we don't wanna be having the same programs. Um, the other thing that I, I do want to point out is that there's still in process a potential infrastructure relief bill, and that will actually be something that we can seriously focus on um, uh, projects that are in process, that are shovel ready, uh, like our water and sewer, but also potentially roads and bridges. Thank you. Just to, just to follow up, uh... I read I read the release yesterday from the League of Municipalities, and it looks like one of the flies in the ointment with this money, or get you know being able to spend it, is uh, Sheboygan and the other cities being able to stay within the expenditure restraint restraint program. Uh, is uh, is that still forthcoming on what you know what the regulations are going to be with that, Todd? Thank you, Born. Um, that is that is one of the topics that I actually brought up in the very beginning with the league was how was this, uh, this money going to affect our levy limits and our expenditure restraint. As, as everybody should know, the city of Sheboygan has um, participated in the expenditure restraint, which allows us to bring additional revenue in, but it also caps us in what we can do. Um, our levy limits were reduced as we all should understand um, 
Last year, we could have increased our levy by 26 cents. We went up only 15 cents um, from a tax base perspective. Uh, the reason we were able to um, control our, our costing is in 2020, we reduced our spending because of COVID and our, our expenditures were reduced because of COVID. If we, the American Rescue Plan does allow us to compensate for 2020, 2021, and, and so forth for the loss in revenues that the, the community would um, has had, the problem is that we've already adjusted our budgets for those uh, losses. And if we are to pay ourselves back, then we have to compensate our levy limits and our expenditure restraint, which will throw us off. It won't throw us off, obviously, in 2020. It won't throw us off in 2021, but it, we will have to make adjustments in 22 and 23. So basically, long story short, if you don't need it, don't take it. My opinion, thanks. Thank you. Any other mm -hmm. discussion or questions? All righty, then that's the end of that then. Uh, next regular meeting date is May 25th, 2021. Uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Motion has been made by Marcus, second by Jim to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Chair votes aye, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.